Hey you guys, welcome back to Conquering Kerbal Space Program, where we're on a mission to put a self-sustaining base on every single planet. We are in the process of getting our moon network set up, and if you take a look here real quick, our attack life support tanks have changed in their appearance. Uh, whether you were paying attention or not when I launched the satellites, I don't know, but this is the TMS uh, sort of re-texture that has now been incorporated as the standard for TAC life support as of version 0 0.12. Uh, so the new developers behind TAC life support have decided that this is now the standard, so you'll get that by default. Okay, so as you may know, or may not know, I don't know, by the quality of the audio, maybe that's obvious, I don't know, um, this is post-commentary once more. Uh, just for basically this video, uh, there is another video that's being uploaded the same day as this one. So if you don't see episode 22 just yet after you're done watching this one, uh, give it a chance, uh, give it some time. Uh, it should You should be able to see it fairly quickly. I encourage you to watch both of them on the same day because they go together really well, I think. Because um, something really cool happens after the after the satellite network is up. I'm pretty proud of it. Uh, okay, so the goal here is essentially to get captured by the moon, and we are on our way in. We've now crossed over in the sphere of influence, and it's really kind of strange. Satellite 3 actually got into the sphere of influence of the moon before Satellite 2 did. I don't know if it just had something to do with the way it was burned or the trajectory that it had. I mean, obviously it has something to do with those things, but um, yeah, it ended up being in the, in the uh, sphere of influence first. Uh, so what I'm doing here throughout this part in terms of like trying to get things around with the moon is I have to manage both satellites at the same time. So you're going to see me switching back and forth between these vessels a lot. And I haven't sped up the video. I considered doing this as more of a time lapse, but because of my, let's say, habit of constantly moving the interface and rotating the camera, um, just something I just do a lot. I know, I'm sorry if it, if it annoys people. Um, but because of that, it actually becomes much more jarring if I time accelerate. So I may look into trying to focus on not doing that so much if I know that I am going to have to provide post commentary in the, in the, in the future. But essentially the goal here is to get uh, burn retrograde. Uh, we have to slow down so that the moon can capture us just like we did satellite one. And I'm essentially setting up maneuver nodes now so that my inclination is not so extreme when I, uh, when I get in there. Uh, so essentially I need to burn retrograde at the right time, slow myself down, let the moon's gravity capture me, and I want to do it in such a way that I don't necessarily end up being super inclined. I want as equatorial, if you will, uh, around the equator. I want my orbit to be around the equator as much as possible. So this that's why the burn is slightly downward in direction, if you will. Uh, it sort of flattens out the orbit a little bit. And then, uh, yeah, I do one maneuver, then I switch to another vessel, do another maneuver, uh, etc. And before I switch vessels, I set up the next maneuver. So in this situation, Kerbal Alarm Clock is a huge lifesaver because in this situation I can look at Kerbal Alarm Clock and say which one of my vessels is going to have their maneuver first and then I need to make sure that I'm on that vessel at the right time because your vessels will not uh, they won't do their burns they won't commit to their burns or execute their maneuvers if they are not the active vessel. I wish that was not the case I wish it would do it on its own because it's a flight computer uh, but that's just the way the game is and I, I guess I sort of understand that having one active vessel at a time So we are going back and forth here a quick little time acceleration Okay, Kerbal alarm clock tells me that it's time to burn And here we go So we see we still have some torque on our vessel. I'm not entirely sure why flight computer has to go back and forth like this. I thought it was because vessels weren't uh, balanced because it provides, it, it would apply torque on the vessel when accelerating, but I'm fairly certain my satellites are balanced. Maybe I'm, I'm just wrong, I don't know. So I noticed that my orbit is a little bit inclined still, a lot more than I'd like. So what I did is I set uh, satellite one as the target and that allows me to get essentially an ascending and descending node for that vessel which I can then use to 
essentially use it as an example to match my orbit's inclination to that satellite. Now that satellite is not completely equatorial either, it's not completely uh, zero, if you will, but it's close enough to where everything will sort of work out. And throughout this, when I am tweaking nodes, I am actually trying to match equator, not necessarily the vessel. So it gives me a starting point as to where that vessel's uh, orbit is, and I can get close and then tweak it further from there. Uh, I think uh, ultimately I end up getting about I think 0.4 degrees is the closest I get to being zero, but it's all good. So we're just gonna switch back and perform the next burn with the other satellite. Yep, M managing multiple satellites at the same time is actually pretty cool. And doing this part here uh, without recording it at the time, or at least without doing voice at the time, actually made it much faster um, because I could just kind of focus on what I'm doing and I don't have to worry about commentary and so I could just go bam 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 with these maneuver nodes I'm just I, I burn one I set another one up I burn one I set another one up I switch vessels burn that set another one up it's pretty quick and ultimately the goal here is to not only just get an equatorial orbit but also I've decided on a height at about 400 kilometers off the surface and our standard satellite build has plenty of Delta V to make this happen. It, it can reach the moon and Minmus pretty easily. Another common problem that I had with uh, managing two satellites at once in sort of the same playthrough like this or in the same at the same time is the flight computer doesn't like to switch to the other vessel. It, t it tends to show me the information from the previous vessel when I switch. This was a problem uh, in 1.0.5 as far as I could tell when I was playing it before. Uh, and it's been a problem ever since I installed it on 1.1. And the way around it, if you find yourself trying to give the flight computer commands and it just says canceling a command, canceling a command, like all the way down every time you hit X, it's because the flight computer is still programmed to the previous vessel, which it's not, it's not currently able to give a signal to because it's not the active vessel. So how you get around that is you just close the flight computer out and then reopen it and that should fix the problem. If you're not running on the latest version of remote tech, if you're still on 1.6 uh, point whatever, uh, I think it's three, then it may not even reset itself even then. You may actually have to reload the vessel completely to get it to work right. So that part's annoying, but as of 1.7, that bug has been removed as far as it not resetting. Um, but you still have the issue where it will sometimes show you what's happening in the previous craft instead of the one you're currently looking at if you leave the flight computer window open uh, at the time. So I, I mean, I've edited out a lot of that stuff, but I think there's going to be several instances here where you'll see the flight computer is on the screen and then nothing happens when I click it and uh, I'll have to close it and reopen it again. And so if you ever notice me closing the flight computer out and then immediately reopening it again, it's because that's what happened. So at this point, each of my three satellites have a completely different orbit. They're all kind of converging on the one, uh, one point there over there uh, where my ships are going now. And that's around 400 kilometers. That's where I want my orbit to be. Um, but they all have a different sort of uh, eccentricity, if you will. Some of them are going much closer to the moon and others are, are farther away. And that's just to provide some diversity in their travel speed because eventually I need them to be all separated. So I'm kind of just planning out the fact that I want them to move around sort of organically and freely and sort of spread themselves out while I'm configuring their final orbits. And then once I get them in the proper position relative to each other, then I can start making them a little bit closer together. The moon is small enough to where I don't need to be super precise. I don't need to like line it up really huge or like line it up really perfectly. Um, I can just sort of line it up to where it works and then make sure their orbital periods are the same so that they never move relative to each other and then just leave it. That's sort of how that would work. And as you can see, Remote Tech has a ton of communication going on. We have a connection to multiple sources for every single satellite, which is great. Redundancy is great. If I ever have to 
you know, remove a satellite from this configuration, or if one of my life support satellites, for example, have to go down to the surface to save a Kerbal or whatever, um, at least there's multiple sources of communication uh, within each one. Or maybe something happens later in the future and an asteroid hits one of my Kerbin satellites. At least there is some redundancy there to where my network may not be completely destroyed in such an event. So that's so why there's a ton of yellow lines all over the place. Um, works pretty well that way. So now the satellites are in roughly the right position, at least this one is. Uh, so I have to close down the flight computer, reopen it up, and then do the node that I want to do. But they're roughly the same, but they're still too far out. You can see there's a ton of space um, between my signals, like sort of my line of sight, and the surface of the moon. So I just make this burn, and it raises up my periapsis to be a little bit closer to the right orbit. This slows down the changes that are happening in the sort of the satellite's positioning, and it's going to let me pull ahead of the one that I'm a little bit behind. Uh, it's going to let me pull ahead of the one that's behind me, so I'm getting further and further away from the one that's back here until my line sort of lines up where I want. And then I'm needing to circularize this, which is what I'm doing now. I'm just going to try and circular the orbit around the point that it needs to be by bringing my periapsis up and having the circle sort of complete where the other satellite is um, and that's going to basically cancel out this movement you know, relative movement if you will around the planet so that hopefully the satellites will stay in roughly the same spot uh, relative to each other at least these two and after fiddling with some uh, maneuver nodes, trying to get things as perfect as possible, I managed to get the apoapsis and the periapsis to be pretty much right at 400 kilometers, which is what my goal was. So we just time accelerate around the moon and we get ready to burn. And just as I'm getting ready to burn, my line of sight to the other satellite is pretty much right on the horizon of the moon. So I'm realizing that I by the time I get to the burn that I need to make, well, <laughs> the distance there is a bit much. So I, I decide to go a little far. Uh, I decide to burn just a little bit further than I normally would, which will allow the satellite that's behind the one I'm currently controlling to catch up a little bit and give us a little bit of distance between, uh, for the line of sight anyway, give us a little bit of distance to the horizon. So as you can see that the line of sight between those two satellites is starting to pull away from the horizon enough to where I'm satisfied with it. So at that point, I need to switch vessels, go back to the satellite that's uh, way too close now. And uh, I need to basically correct satellite one because it's no longer the right model. Now the other two, which are matched to each other, those are now the models. So sat satellite one needs to be fixed. So all I'm going to do here is I'm going to tell the flight computer to point at the node, burn retrograde, bring my periapsis down a bit so that um, by basically by slowing myself down, I speed up my relative speed, my orbital speed um, around the planet. My, my, I reduce my orbital period, if you will, just like we always do with our orbits. And that's going to allow satellite one to ultimately pull ahead of the one that's that it's now right next to and it can uh, pull ahead and catch up to the other one and uh, ultimately get in the right position. At least that's the goal anyway. And now there's a little bit of maneuver finicking. I'm trying to get the maneuvers to line up exactly where I want it, right at 400 kilometers. It takes a little bit of work, so we'll just cut here and uh, resume when we're done. And here we are, and we are pretty much done, 399 and 399 again. Even 399.99 is not good enough for me. I want exactly 400 kilometers. So there we go. Find it, get the maneuver in place. It's not a whole lot of delta V. We have plenty of delta V in this arrangement. And uh, no big deal. Now I am noticing that the burn is going to be really short and at 100% thrust, the flight computer it tends to have a problem with really small burns. Um, it just sometimes, well almost all the times, if the burn is under a second, the flight computer tends to overshoot on the delta V uh, commitment there. So I go ahead and I limit my thrust of my engine, uh, limit the thrust of the engine all the way down, make the computer take at least two seconds to burn, and at that point it can be much more precise. This is sort of how I get around not having RCS. Um, it's kind of a I don't know. I, I, I have no need for RCS in these satellites. Uh, I can rotate the crafts with a built-in reaction wheel, and um, you know, which is 
It uses electric power and it's slower than using RCS, but it has the added benefit of allowing me to adjust my attitude without actually adjusting the orbit itself. RCS, when it's burning around, it has the tendency to adjust your orbit a little bit. You'll be technically burning prograde, retrograde, radial, whatever at the same time while you're rotating your craft. And that's especially true if you're leaving your SAS on while you're doing it because then SAS tries to correct it and tries to hold the line while you're moving it and it just burns in different directions. So I don't really like RCS when I need something precision that doesn't involve docking with another craft or rendezvousing with another craft because I just feel like it's a, a bit of a waste. So my way of around that is to just limit the thrust on the engines, point where I want to go, and uh, let the flight computer do its thing. And that has the also the added benefit of not being uh, more expensive. RCS is expensive, and it's also more weight on the craft, so it's going to take more delta V to get it up into the, into space. So not only does it reduce my delta V while costing me more money, um, but it provides a function that is really just easily replaced in this sense, so that's why I don't put RCS in my satellites. Okay, so we have two satellites that are really good relative to each other, and you can see satellite one is dipping down. Its, its orbit is a little lower on one side, and that's letting it pull further and further away. And so we'll just do a bunch of time acceleration here until I see the triangle form. And then I need to give it a little bit more space to make sure that it's sort of equal. I don't want any type of, I don't want anything to happen. But I know that by the time satellite one gets to where I need to make the maneuver, uh, it'll probably be all equaled out and we'll have a nice triangle. So I'm setting the maneuver now. Uh, and so by the time it gets up there, it will be great. So we'll just let the craft turn itself, we'll limit the thrust to make sure that the flight computer takes more than a second. Uh, I like to do two or three seconds for a flight computer burn just to make sure the precision is there. And you got to make sure that the flight computer is looking at the node before you start doing a bunch of time acceleration. Because if it's not looking at the node before it gets to where, the no to where it needs to burn, that's when you see the flight computer just spin out of control and you'll just fly all over the place. So if you're noticing that, you know, your flight computer burn didn't work out quite the way you thought and it was just going all over the place and it just keeps burning, trying to figure out where the node is and spinning around, it's because you probably time accelerated before the maneuver node, before the flight computer was on top of the maneuver node. And so it's just burning around trying to catch it. Okay, so with that burn, we are done. We have everything looking pretty good. Now I just need to finalize the orbital period for each satellite to make sure that they are all identical. And yeah, with all those orbits being exactly the same, we're good to go. And uh, we shouldn't have the same problems as we had with Kerbin before. Uh, the problem I had with my satellites in a previous episode, by the way, uh, was not only power, although that was a problem with one satellite, the problem actually was distance. At 850 kilometers, the antennas that I had just barely fall out of range. Uh, it was super close. So a couple of people in the comments in the video uh, 15, I think it was, uh, Timothy and John, thanks. Uh, they basically were telling me that this was the problem. They they ran the smart person math that I was too lazy to run and they figured it out. So, um, But I had already adjusted it to 830 kilometers uh, to relieve the battery issue long before those uh, comments, long before I had uploaded it and stuff. So that fixed both problems. By moving them closer together, it not only fixed the battery life problem, but the antenna range problem as well. And that's not a problem anymore. Uh, so we won't have we won't have it on the moon because we're only 400 kilometers away from the surface. We have plenty of distance left to go in our antennas. And uh, that's pretty much it, guys. That's our moon network. It's fully set up. It's ready to rock. Uh, I recorded this video like 12:30 at night. I was getting tired, and um, as I tilted the screen down and we saw Kerbin in the background, uh, I noticed that our scanning satellite was hovering over top of the planet. And I said, you know what, let's go click on that and let's check on that. And I, what happens uh, next, I could not replicate it again to save my life. There's just no way. If I had not clicked on that satellite at that precise moment, it, it just would not have worked the way it did. So if you want to see what I'm talking about, check out the next episode. It's episode 22. Should be uploaded pretty much right now. Um, and yeah, tell, let me know what you think. Like, subscribe if you want to see more, more stuff and help the channel. Likes really help. Comments really help. I really like talking to you guys. And uh, we will see you next time. Bye.